Hi, I'm Drew Thorstensen, and I'm one of the technical leads for Power VC. Today I'll be talking to you about the high-level concepts of software-defined networking and how we've incorporated them into the Power VM platform. To understand SDN and the need for it, we really need to take a step back and look at the world before virtualization. In that world, you had a long-running workload that was tied to exactly one system. That workload did not move around, and because of this assumption, network controls could be added to the switch that plugged directly into the server. But as the world progressed, workloads became virtualized. Tens or hundreds of virtual machines started to run on a physical server, and the VMs gained mobility, that is, the ability to move between different physical servers at any given time. Because of this, you could no longer reliably apply rules at an edge switch for a given virtual machine. Over time, as VM density in the data center grew, the behavior changed by focusing less on control of the VM's networking and more on simple connectivity of the VM. That essentially meant making sure that the required VLAN was in the appropriate place. That brings us to today. We've added software-defined networking to the Power VM platform. But what is it? Well, software-defined networking is a set of tools and technologies that allow us to virtualize the network and bring that per VM network control back. In the Power VM implementation, you can modify workloads networking controls without needing any physical switch modifications. SDN has five key focus areas. The first is quality, being able to control throughput of the workload. Next is automation. As you scale to several thousand virtual machines, you need policy-based management and the ability to apply those rules quickly across a large set of VMs. Next up is capacity. As your virtual networks fill up and get used more, having the ability to add additional capacity to remove bottlenecks. The fourth focus area is speed. This means being able to put new rules and policies into place in seconds and have those rules be applied immediately. Lastly is security, being able to control at the hypervisor level whether or not workloads can talk to each other. And if they can talk to each other, being able to put restrictions on what ports or IP addresses they can talk to. In a typical software-defined network, you'll likely see these general requirements. A programmable virtual switch, a virtual router, and then the controller. The programmable virtual switch for PowerVM sits in the Novalink LPAR. I'll go into more detail on that in a bit. But essentially, this virtual switch is the very first entity that the workload's Ethernet traffic touches, even for interpartition communication. If all of the, it all goes through the virtual switch on the Novalink LPAR. That virtual switch then has a set of rules applied to it provided by the controller. The controller, in this case PowerVC, has high-level policies defined within it. It then works with the virtual switch to send those rules down and compile them into low-level rules that the virtual switch can apply. These would be your QoS, security, or even overlay rules. Lastly, since you're virtualizing the network, certain types of traffic will be put on an entirely virtual overlay network. Therefore, you need some entity that can transform that virtual overlay network traffic and put it onto your wide area network. That is the role of the virtual router. In PowerVM 2.2.5 and PowerVC 1.3.2, administrators can build a technical preview SDN environment. Having a technical preview allows us to get feedback from users as we finalize the development of this work. It also enabled us to get this technology out early for users to experiment with. The prerequisites to running this technical preview are the following. It requires a PowerVM 2.2.5 system running Novalink. A physical Ethernet card must be attached to that Novalink LPAR for data network communication. And then either PowerVC 1.3.2 
or OpenStack Newton can be used to control the system. PowerVM uses OpenVSwitch as the programmable virtual switch. It sits on top of the physical Ethernet port or ports on the Novalink LPAR. Each virtual Ethernet adapter on each LPAR will have a point-to-point -point connection between it and the OpenV switch. The SDN controller, such as PowerVC, manages all of the virtual networking in the system for you. The SDN controller puts rules on the system that can get compiled down for OpenV switch to enforce. As you can see, we've also been focused on building on open technologies. For this enablement, we're building on top of industry standard elements such as OpenStack and OpenVSwitch. And as a reminder, PowerVC, being built on OpenStack, takes advantage of this enablement within OpenStack itself. Building on these open technologies allows us to deliver a level of maturity to PowerVM administrators that enables key features like live partition mobility, adding and removing rules on the fly, and policy definition. Now that we've shown the how, I think you'd be interested in the what. What new use cases become available to you? Our technical preview focuses on the following aspects. Overlay networks, network nodes, security groups, and rate limiting. Each of these can be used independently or together. Pick and choose the capabilities that make sense for your environment. For instance, if you have a low number of hosts or little need for isolation, you may not want to use the overlay networks yet. Instead, you may focus on security groups and QoS. However, if you have a large number of hosts, workloads, or tenants in your environment, and you need to simplify connectivity, then the overlay networks are probably your first point of interest. We'll start with overlays, which are the first step to virtualizing your network. This is unfortunately the hardest part of SDN to understand, but perhaps the most valuable. With traditional VLAN networks, your virtual machine's raw Ethernet packet gets put on the network. This means that if you have a lot of VLANs, you need to put those VLANs on many switches. This has several disadvantages, including configuration complexity, and it can dramatically increase your broadcast domain. When using an overlay network, your virtual machine's Ethernet packet gets embedded into your Novalink's IP packet. This means that your workloads don't directly send data on the network. They're carried within a basic Internet protocol packet. Therefore, the port on your Novalink only needs one VLAN and one IP address. These IP packets communicate with each other through a VXLAN tunnel. The PowerVM Novalink hosts, hosts then create these VXLAN tunnels between each other. Each host, or specifically the Novalink LPAR on your PowerVM system, will create a tunnel to the other hosts in the network. As I noted earlier, the VMs or LPARs never directly send traffic over the network, Instead, their traffic gets embedded into these tunnels. Since these tunnels run on layer 3, it doesn't actually matter what VLAN backs the data plane. So if you have some hosts on one VLAN and other hosts on another, it doesn't matter. As long as the connection between the IP addresses work and there is sufficient bandwidth. Now that we've discussed how the hosts get connected to each other, the next step is to understand how a virtual machine's traffic gets put into these tunnels. The VM's Ethernet packet is actually encapsulated into the Novalink's IP packet, so the VM will send with an Ethernet packet with a maximum transmit unit, or MTU, of 1450. That gets put into the Novalink's 1500 byte packet and sent through the tunnel. PowerVC's technical preview supports the VXLAN overlay protocol. This is a common protocol in the data center for overlays. VXLAN supports several million different segments, or previously what you'd think of as VLANs. So you should never run out of distinct virtual networks to create for your workloads. It's important to note that the source host takes the 1415 byte packet from the VM, 
And then the open V switch in the Novalink encapsulates it into the 1500 byte packet. It then sends the packet to the host running the target VM. That target host's open vSwitch then knows how to de-encapsulate the packet and send the 1450 byte packet to the right VM. The virtual machines themselves know nothing about the underlying VXLAN network. At this point, you hopefully have an understanding of how we create these tunnels, VX, these virtual VXLAN-based networks. But all I've shown is how VM-to-VM -VM traffic flows. You're running servers in your data center. And it would, be a, it would be safe to assume that some of that traffic comes from and is sent to systems outside of that virtual network. I'll talk next about how we send traffic out of the virtual network to the broader wide area network. Then I'll explain how the wide area network trap how the wide area network can send traffic into this virtual network. Both of these scenarios rely on a con concept called network nodes. A network node is a server that resides on your network but has connectivity between the PowerVM Novalink hosts and your wide area network. You typically have fewer network nodes than you do hosts. For instance, if you have 50 hosts, you may only need 5 network nodes. And if you have 200 hosts, you may want 10 or 20 network nodes to help with throughput. The network infrastructure team would really be focused on the network nodes rather than the hosts themselves, which helps with your scale-out strategy. The network nodes run the virtual routers for the VXLAN networks. Each VXLAN network should have a virtual router. A virtual router takes traffic from your VXLAN network and then bridges it onto the wide area network. This works a lot like your router at home. Your ISP has given you a public IP address, but behind it you have several devices. That router bridges all of the traffic through network address translation to that single IP. The virtual router on the network node does the same. You typically have one virtual router per overlay network, but a given network node can run many virtual routers on it. Also, since this is the data center and not your home's network, we make sure that a network node has redundancy. Therefore, if a network node fails, the virtual routers running on it will fail over to another network node. In this example, I simulated a failure of the network node. Now both routers are running through the secondary network node. Routers are key to enabling external traffic. However, a basic router only handles traffic originating from within the VXLAN network going out. What about traffic that starts from outside and needs to come in to the overlay network? That is where floating IP addresses comes in. The floating IP concept works within the router on your network nodes. Floating IP addresses allow you to take an IP address from the wide area network and translate it to a private VXLAN endpoint. In this example, I have a public IP address of 1.23.45.67. That is now set in the system to translate to the private VXLAN network and its corresponding IP address. Now traffic coming in from the external wide area network sent to 1.23.45.67 will be forwarded on to workload B. Key to this concept though is that the workload itself never knows that public IP address. It's all translated through in the router. So at this point we've covered how you can create VXLAN networks and use virtual routers to connect them to your wide area network. It's also important to know that VXLAN network creation is instantaneous and you can have millions, so create them as you see fit. But SDN has more features than overlay networks. Security groups can be used with VXLAN networks or with your traditional flat or VLAN based networks. These groups control what workloads can talk to. It is important to note this is controlled in the hypervisor itself. These rules are not put into the client's operating system. 
So no matter the operating system, AIX, IBM I, or Linux, these rules get enforced. We believe this to be a big time saver for administrators. Rules themselves are generally quite specific, but are bundled together into high-level policies. Those policies can then be applied to multiple workloads. It's also important to know that rules are, by nature, inclusive. The policies simply state what you are allowed to talk to. So a policy with no rules means that a workload can't talk to anything. If the policy allows port 443, that would mean that HTTPS traffic is allowed through, but nothing else. In this example, workload A only has a rule that allows pings to work to it. Workload B only allows SSH or HTTPS traffic, but blocks everything else. Workload C will only accept traffic for workload B, though it will, though it will accept any type of traffic from workload B. PowerVC's default security group allows everything to talk to everything. Be sure to swap in your own security group when you deploy a VM so that the system applies your security group rules instead. But remember that you can also change security groups after you deploy your VM. So if you need to make any changes, you can do so and those rules will be updated across your environment instantly. The last feature that we're demonstrating in this tech preview is rate limiting. This is fortunately the easiest to understand. Our tech preview allows you to define QoS policies. These policies can be dynamically added to a workload and define how fast you will allow traffic to be sent from your workload. This can be useful if you want to limit, say, some development workloads from potentially interfering with more important workloads that are running on those same systems. Again, this is enforced down in the hypervisor or specifically on the PowerVM NovaLink partition. Okay, we've gone over some deeper concepts here. We're hoping you have a better understanding of SDN, but what's next? Well, first we plan to dem publish another video that shows an actual example driven from PowerVC. That will demonstrate how we have implemented this tech preview and allow you to see it in action. We should have that published shortly. But the next step can really be in your court. We have this tech preview as part of PowerVM 2.2.5 and PowerVC 1.3.2. <clears throat> we have information in our Knowledge Center on how to install it, configure it, and use it. We are really looking for feedback from you, the users. That feedback will help us shape the future of SDN and PowerVM to make sure that you have the tools and features you need to be successful. We look forward to hearing from you, seeing what you create, and what updates will benefit you. Let us know how it goes. Thank you.